Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you to uh, Senjin for inviting me. Let me see if I can work this thing. There we go. Um, how many people are familiar with geography? A few? A few, okay. How many enjoyed geography in high school? That's surprising. I'm, uh, I hated geography in high school. <laughs> anyway, now I'm, uh, it's my business. Um, so one of the things that uh, has happened is geography is, is around, everybody uses it. How many people have a navigation system in their car? How many, let's put it this way, how many don't? A few. There's geography, I mean, there's so many examples of it. Try this again. Okay, so this is what I'm going to talk about this afternoon. We'll talk a little bit about geography, what it is, because uh, that's a lot of things to a lot of people. Um, and what is a GIS, a geographic information system? So this is a, a digital system for processing uh, ge geographic data. And it's a little different than a lot of other things. And one of the reasons why I think I'm here today is because uh, my area is spatial data infrastructure. And spatial data infrastructure is uh, how you shuffle all this data around. There's all kinds of different kinds of data and you need to get it from A to B and how do you do that so that when A sends it, B understands it. And then uh, I'll look at a bit of uh, some examples of patterns of use. So we're kind of like lumpers. So instead of like the internet, just basically there's connections everywhere. We try to lump things together, trying to make some sense out of it so you can adapt products, if you want to call it that, to, to your particular, uh, what we call a pattern of use. And then a, a little bit of a summary. So basically, uh, geography is the science of the world, and um, it's how you you know, measure things on the world, how you position things on the world. And the other thing that really helps with is understanding what's going on. So there's a lot of things, you know, uh, uh, you know where we live, the world is complex. I mean, there's, a, uh, you have no idea. How many people have traveled the world? A few? Yeah, I have as well. It's a, it's a big place and there's a lot of stuff going on. And uh, there's really two things, you know, Mother Nature is doing a lot of stuff. There's a lot of things changing all the time. Um, and humans, there's a huge impact uh, from human activity on the world. So how do you measure these things? And they're always changing. How do you know what's going on? I mean, it's pretty hard to tell sometimes, but uh, it is somehow you have to uh, make some sense of it. And um, especially with, uh, you know, with what's going on, the human footprint is is huge on the world. I mean, you look at flying over the cities to see how big the cities are, and and uh, you know some of the other things that are going on. You know, the uh, what they call climate change. Um, you know, that's going on. Although it's been going on for a long time before even we were around, but you know, this was under ten meters of ice here at one time. Um, so anyway, you have to somehow measure that. So. For those who aren't into saving the world, you have some little more practical applications here. This is, uh, these are some of the examples of the kind of things that you can use this technology for. So, uh, you know, cities and environment and public safety. I mean, there's a lot of different examples of what you can do with the digital geography. And so I'll get into some of those. Uh, so this is the GIS, this is the Geographic Information System. And basically, there's several things. You know, you measure something on the world. Uh, you uh, visualize it so the humans can understand what's going on. You can analyze it and model it. And then you can do planning. So, OK, I'm going to do this thing. And then you actually do something with some kind of action. So how many people know, probably there's not very many, how many people know that the GIS concepts are actually invented in Ottawa? Oh, there's a few. Good. I'm surprised, I'm impressed, actually. And this gentleman here is the guy who invented it. Uh, Roger Tomlinson is the uh, uh, Order of Canada. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away a couple of months after this photo was taken. But it was invented here in Ottawa back in the 60s. He used it for the uh, Canada Land Inventory System. And you can imagine what he was doing back in the 60s. Imagine the kind of computers it had. Anyway, he, it's, uh, it's a local technology which has been exploited now it's all, all around the world. The other absolute coincidence is today is GIS Day. So I'd like everybody to stand up and say, Happy GIS Day to their neighbor. <laughs> hey, come on, don't be shy. Happy GIS Day, everybody. <laughs> Happy GIS Day. <laughs> 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 Happy GIS Day. <laughs> 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 Happ
Happy GIS Day there who knew the, about GIS in Ottawa. <laughs> and the other gentleman over here. Anyway, that's just a complete coincidence, but I thought I'd throw that slide in. The other thing, uh, I guess I, can I go backwards? Okay. The other thing, this is the, the slide that was provided to me. It kind of looks like they turned the world upside down. I don't know why they did that slide, but anyway, that's kind of what it looks like to me. Anyway, it's GIS Day, so. Um, so where are we today? So in terms of the te technology, or I should say the uses or the patterns of use, you've got uh, systems of record, which are uh, basically you want to know where everything is. You have a record of that. Um, a system of engagement, and that's where a lot of this um, use of GIS data over the web and over the networks is, is done because you're engaging someone. So you have a data set here and the user over here, and somehow you have to be able to communicate and provide details back and forth. And then a system of insight where you can um, look at the data and make, do some analysis and get some results. So this is kind of the way we look at it. I really can't read the bottom part there, but uh, you see a system of record, insight, and engagement. But it's used for a lot of different purposes. I mean, it's just amazing what this technology is being used for. So some examples like air, land, and water, um, working on a lot of those. I'm actually working on a project right now on the maritime limits and boundaries. Uh, natural resources, when I was in the federal government, I spent a lot of time in Natural Resources Canada. Transportation, of course, it's, everybody's using that for logistics, that kind of thing. Utilities, energy, getting energy to places. Uh, buildings and facilities, that's just a new one that's coming on. Business and commerce, like where are you gonna put the local, the next Walmart, where are you gonna put the next Canadian Tire? A lot of that work is done using GIS. And then health, uh, I think there were some examples this morning. And then another area which is uh, growing quite a bit is defense, uh, public safety and security. So Canada actually now, and they mentioned CRTC, and we're, we've been dealing with CRTC a couple of times, but it's mostly on the public safety side. They've mandated that the 911 system be upgraded to another next generation, next to NG911, next generation 911, and that's to be available in the next little while. And the interesting thing about next generation 911 is there's a requirement to have GIS included before uh, NG911 in your, in your, GI, in your uh, 911 system. There was no requirement on map data. So somebody would go to an event and had basically no information. So how does this work? Well, here, here's a, just a really sort of one slide example of how it works. You have base layers, and these are the basic layers that you would normally see on a map. So those would be the roads, the uh, uh, river systems, the lakes, that kind of thing. But one additional aspect, if you have a map, is that it'll have annotation on it. So it'll tell you, okay, this is the city of Ottawa, this is the city of Toronto. Another base layer that's quite often used are uh, images. And you see an example there of, of a raster image. And then, on, so once you have that, you have your base layers, then you put all these thematic layers, or sometimes known as business layers, or sometimes known as operational layers. They go on top of that and they're registered. So you can actually look down and say, okay, here's the city of Ottawa, they have, they're in. How many knew the city of Ottawa was in a model forest? It is, there's model forests around Canada, and Ottawa's actually in one. So there's examples of that. So this is, uh, nowadays we have a lot of this data coming in, there's a ton of data, you know, we, everybody's talked about computing and networks and all that kind of thing, and somebody gets a bright idea and innovation. So these sort of come together, and then GIS applications are produced uh, from that. So if you have all this data, and you're doing this, you know, these uh, good things with it, um, what is an SDI? So an SDI, uh, this is an, another really quick runaround on it, uh, where you have some data, which you see there on your, uh, your left, and it goes into a server, and then it's fed out for various applications. So, you know, some of them could be, uh, you know, dispatch system for 911, it could be repairing the streets, it could be just tracking vehicles, that kind of thing. And, but the problem is, out in the world, everything is changing. And you know, trucks move and things get moved and that kind of thing. So somehow you have to be able to feed that back in. And you can do that through um, either a human going out with their tablet in the field and collecting information or video cameras, that kind of thing. Feed that back into the system and then feed it back out again. So it's kind of like an endless loop. So, I mean, I used to complain to the government of Canada. You say, well, the mapping of Canada is finished. We've done it. But it's never done. And I used to complain to them all the time about that. And it finally got the wording changed, but it didn't help. <laughs> They lost the program anyway. So the, uh, it, it's, it's never actually done. Some of it is done, but it's never actually completed. So 
the other thing about GIS is it's an open and interoperable platform. And interoperability, I really haven't heard that word that used that much here today, but that is, that's the word that we use. So one system can talk well to the other, it's an interoperable system. And so within there you have APIs, so you can have one system, you know, sort of the computer to computer kind of, uh, of applications. Um, open standards, there's a ton of open standards. There's the uh, uh, ISO, the IHO, and the uh, W3C, and the OGC, that's the Open Geospatial Consortium. And for our company, I sit on, I'm a member of the technical committee of the Open Geospatial Consortium. We, it meets uh, about four times per year, and if you're really interested, actually the last meeting in September was in Banff, but the one next summer, I believe it's in June, is in Montreal, so if you're interested in, in, in uh, geo, geospatial standards, that's where the international standards are developed. Uh, open data, big, big push now, uh, great push by the government to get their data out of their silos and out into the community and being used. And um, a lot of governments, uh, big and small, are making their data open now. Open science, uh, you see some examples there. Python is, is one that you see lots of lots of uh, applications and little libraries that you can use. And then uh, open source, and you just heard the panel, we, we use open source. Actually, there was last year, there was a, um, a survey done, uh, an assessment done, and it's pretty hard to, I mean, there were people were discussing, well, you know, just some examples of where it's used a little, and other examples where it's used a lot. It's hard to get a metric of what, how to measure this. But anyway, in, our, in this metric, they were talking about how many employees were providing information into GitHub and uh, Esri was actually in the low 20s, but uh, the one company that was less than us or, or provided less was the next one down the list was Apple. So we're one step ahead of Apple. Okay, this is one I mentioned earlier about the data, different kinds of data. And uh, I'll just go into some of these in a little bit of detail. Uh, imagery is one, so there's uh, all kinds of imagery. I'll have some uh, additional examples of where that comes from later. Uh, tabular data, that's where you got even a, a mailing list. Like they took the mailing list, and I've seen this done at many uh, um, sessions where they take the mailing list of the people who just registered for the event and plot it on a map. I mean, that's so simple to do. Um, unstructured, that's where you can go through a document and find information about spatial relationships and that kind of thing. You don't see that too much in the general community. You see that mostly in the intelligence community. Uh, vector, that's sort of the... Um, workhorse of GIS systems where you have a point, a line, and a polygon, and the, using those three kind of constructs, you can make most anything. 3D, uh, the horsepower for the systems, uh, for the computing is just becoming sufficient enough now that you can do, uh, do quite a bit with 3D now, and I think I have some, a uh, couple of examples of that. Big data, that's, uh, uh, you know, in the olden days, there was this uh, technology called cyber computing. And cyber computing, what it was, was to try and do big data processes by reducing the amount of data because you could, didn't want to take three days or three weeks to do the analysis. But the best example I heard just recently was where they took every uh, taxi, uh, the New York City makes their taxi information available. Somebody took that, put it into a big data system, and analyzed it. So how many people have any idea what the most popular destination is for taxis in New York City? I mean, there's tens and thousands or millions of these things a day. There's huge numbers. So over a year, anybody, any, any ideas? The United Nations, that's the most popular destination. So given that knowledge, um, what time do you think is the most popular place to have people dropped off? Nine o'clock in the morning. They all want to get to the UN at nine o'clock in the morning. So that's the kind of thing you can do with some of the big data, because you, you, you can imagine New York City. I mean, the lady was talking here this morning about uh, New York City, and it's just a huge place. Um, the next one is LiDAR. This is a new one. How many people are familiar with LiDAR? Oh, excellent. Wow, very good. Um, it's uh, the platform you put it on is dependent on a lot of things. You can have ground-based LiDAR. You can have airborne LiDAR. There's no. Uh, there's no satellite LiDAR yet, but because you, you don't have the power to get the, the laser to the ground. Um, but it's a very good way of getting three dimensions, three dimensional aspects of things, because uh, LiDAR, like it's, it's similar to radar where you bounce signal off, except the, because it's light, 
the frequency uh, is higher, so the wavelength is smaller, you can measure uh, distances much, much better. Very, very nice new technology that's coming on board now. Uh, BIM, this is a building information model. So what that is, it allows most of the work that we've done so far is based on outdoors. So what's happening outdoors? BIM allows you to integrate what's going on indoors. And the big difference there is that uh, indoors you don't have access to GPS. So you really can't tell exactly where you are in the building. But uh, with the BIM model, at least you can integrate all the data. And once somebody finally figures out how to do indoor positioning, then you'll be able to you know, navigate your way through the shopping malls or the campus or wherever it is you happen to be. And the last item is networks. And this is not the networks you guys are probably familiar with. These are the railway networks, the hydro networks, the sewer networks, the water networks. And how do you connect all those things together? So it's, it's uh, an interesting uh, approach on the word networks, but it's, it's generally not electronic networks. So there was some talk earlier about governance, and they asked me to throw in a governance slide, and I have done a lot of work on governance. Um, but basically, there's sort of five things you need to look at for data governance. One, the first one is, you know, why are you doing this? Like, what's the, what's the business case? Like, why are you connect, collect, uh, collecting this data? What are you going to use it for? Uh, the next is, how are you going to collect it and manage it? So that's one of the things that you certainly need to, uh, to investigate. Uh, then you got to look after the data. So what's the security for it? Uh, who owns it? You know, in other words, the legal aspects to it. And accessibility. So if you have it out there, how do people access it? Um, reliability and quality. The issue with a lot of the GIS data is you have good data and you have bad data. So there could be a lot of reasons for that. Uh, but the best thing is to have the best data that you can possibly collect. And uh, because even the best data is collected still as some minor errors in it. And then, of course, the last thing is the platform, the standards, and you know, the architecture that you're using to get this, uh, to get this data out. Um, so the next thing I'll talk about a bit is, is the big data. And I was um, looking at this earlier. There's about two, as of, well, this is a few months back, 2.7 zettabytes of data in existence today. And 90% of that was generated in the past two years. So data is being collected at a tremendous rate. And it grows at about 1.2 zettabytes per year. So I mean, that's a lot of data. And um, if it continues at this rate, by 2023, there will be about 10 zettabytes of uh, data in existence, digital data in existence. Um, by 2039, you're at 1,000 zettabytes. I don't know what that is. To me some other big number. They've already gone to Z, so I don't know what they're going to use next. Anyway, if you think about what the, where the technology is today, the storage, there's a sufficient storage. The storage industry is able to build enough devices to, to store all that. Um, but what about the networks? I mean, how, if you're getting this kind of data coming down your pipe, how are you going to handle it? I know some of the, uh, um, you know, the optical networks can probably handle this kind of thing, but how do you shuffle all this data around? Because it's just becoming, you know, people wanted, you know, even in the television world, they wanted, you know, they had their color TV and then they wanted high definition. Everybody went to high definition. Now they're going to 8K, you know, 4K systems and 8K systems. So everybody just wants more and more. Same with your phone or your computer. You just end up storing more and more stuff. And the problem isn't storing it now. The problem is how do you get it there and how do you get it out? Um, so. I, this is my own personal opinion, but what's causing this data growth? Well, um, uh, mobile phone multimedia data, of course, everybody's snapping pictures like crazy, which is fine. Um, and general business data like emails and websites, I mean, there's a lot of that going on. People are, you know, we're in the digital transformation. We've talked about that uh, quite a bit today. Um, but I suggest that a lot of it's coming from uh, geospatial data sources. So the satellite imagery is one of them. And I believe in the next year, we're going to hit over 1,000 Earth observing satellites uh, orbiting the Earth. And one of the companies that, one of the bigger companies that uh, does that is Planet Labs. And they bring in 1.5 million, not gigabytes or whatever, 1.5 images per day, 1.5 million images per day. So that's in the, in the uh, terabyte per day range of, of if you want to call volumes of data. Huge. I mean, Canada, 
the Canadian Space Agency just supported MDA to put up a radar sat net, uh, network, radar sat constellation, the RCM. We just launched, it's now operational. And it's a radar satellite, so it's just, you have, it's not quite like an optical one where you take a picture and you have it, the radar, you send the signal down, you gotta process all this, so you collect the raw data and then you do a whole bunch of processing before you can get something that's actually really useful. And so the amount of processing and all the steps through registering all that data, I mean, it's huge data requirements and how you process and get it around is, is uh, is, is a challenge. Uh, uh, airborne imagery and LIDAR, so there's not quite, airborne is probably peaked, I would say, this is my opinion once again, um, where, uh, you know, in the old days, you fly an airplane, put a, put a camera on it, put a LIDAR on it, and away you go, you just capture all this map data. But uh, the next one, the drones are taking over. So you have drone imagery, I mean, even one of the videos we saw this morning with the, uh, the trucks with the, uh, with the advertising on it, there was a lot of drone imagery in that, just in that clip. So those images can actually be used to do photogrammetry, which is measuring the earth and, and getting it all, all uh, figured out where things are. So just a simple drone, a few thousand dollars, so that's taking over. You get a lot of cities very interested in drone mapping now because it's, it's aerial or airborne surveillance is, is, is too expensive. Um, and then ground-based imagery, so you have trucks driving by, you have the Google cars driving by with all the, all the gear on it. I mean, it's, uh, you know, you have, and you have stationary ones, you have uh, all your, your security cameras, all that kind of thing. Videos, mobile phones, you know, a lot of people are taking a lot of, uh, a lot of images, a lot of ground-based imagery that's quite useful in, uh, in various applications. And uh, so what's, uh, uh, what's driving this, what's, what's, uh, pushing this, so there are, you know, some of the technology, I talked a bit about that, but some of the new application, digital government, I mean, there's been a few people talk about the government, like all governments are starting to finally digitize more and more things, and one of the ones they're using more heavily now is, uh, is GIS. Um, and there hasn't been too much uh, discussion of that, but improved user interfaces, uh, improved GUI. If you make the, if you make the, User interface, so simple that anybody can use it. People are gonna to come to your site. You start getting into all these complicated things, uh, you know, filling out these forms on government websites. I mean, they just don't cut it anymore. You need to have it simple. Like Google had this figured out. You do a search in one line, no matter what it is you're looking for, same line, you go in there and do the search. So if you can get it down to that level, you're doing really, really well. Um, and then we're seeing a lot of increased uh, use of digital uh, geography in uh, the traditional sectors where you'd expect it, uh, but there's a, uh, quite a, a significant increase in what we call non-traditional industries as well, so there's a lot, a lot going on. So one of the things that we like to do uh, in SDIs is it's unlike the internet, which sort of, as I mentioned earlier, sort of connected, everything is connected to everything else and there's sort of no hierarchy. We just, and there isn't really a hierarchy of SDIs, but we try to look at, think of it this way where you have a community uh, which is closer, they look at probably a smaller area, uh, but there's more of them. And then you go to the municipal level of say government and then the provincial, uh, the national level and the global. And actually at the national level, CGDI is the Canadian Geospatial Data Infrastructure. That's the one that sort of everything is based on and it matches up with the global activities. And so as long as somebody down in the community uh, abides by the standards and the interoperability requirements, then that data can be shuffled over and somebody in Thailand can be using that data just as easily as somebody in, in Ottawa. So it's, um, it's a way of trying to make sure that everything is, is, is um, interoperable top to bottom and around the world. And another way, another thing we look at is the user uh, capability. And uh, if you look at it sort of Google Maps is kind of at the bottom, where you see their, their, their target market, if you want to call it, is consumers. And we've been at the geospatial practice, so the experts in, in geospatial are at the top, and then a small community, uh, very tight-knit. Um, but then you have all this huge area in between, which are the smart people, they're doing lots of good things, but they're in forestry, they're in mining, we heard about that, they're running cities, that kind of thing. They don't really know that much about geospatial or mapping, that kind of thing. So that's where there's, in theory, a lot of 
potential applications of this kind of thing. Because you know these guys need it, and uh, or these folks need it, and um, it hasn't been dumbed down to the point yet where they can actually use it. So it's, there's, a, there's a quite a bit of, of uh, potential activity there. So this on the web map side, I mean, everybody knows, like you probably to get here, you looked at uh, uh, some kind of map on your phone. Uh, a lot of people are doing that for, if you want to call it consumer reasons, but there's a lot of other business reasons why people want to do web maps. And they're, you know, everybody uh, uses them and they're at that level where they're dumbed down enough that anybody can use it, whether they have any experiences. So Senjin asked me to talk a bit about smart cities. And uh, so what's a smart city and what's a smart community? Well, there's some examples here, you know, the you know, help improves the life of the people in the city, um, you know, increased efficiency, you know, traffic, you know, everybody knows about traffic, uh, governments and communities and um, smart. Uh, the one thing is smart is not a, a destination, it's a journey. So you're, it's just like mapping, you're never really done. Smart, you're never really smart. So it's a, it's a, it's a process, uh, but it is a digital transformation. And just recently, I don't know a lot of you people are probably familiar with this, but Industry Canada, or sorry, Infrastructure Canada had a smart cities challenge and they challenged all these cities to send in their, their application. And there's really four requirements, you know, uh, realize outcomes for the residents, uh, empower communities to innovate, uh, forge new partnerships, and uh, spread the benefits to all Canadians. In other words, do it in a small place and then spread it out. Um, and I do write a blog and actually blogged on that particular one, but uh, uh, I do put out blogs on different things. But uh, in my blog, I mentioned there's four, the four winners there. So Montreal won the, uh, the big award. That was a $50 million award. Uh, Guelph and Wellington County, a uh, smaller award. Nunavut and Bridgewater, Nova Scotia. So Montreal has improved mobility, uh, circular food economy, safe environments and digital connectivity and access to home energy. The interesting thing about this is all the winners, there's an element of, of geograph geography in all of those applications. That there's not one of them that, where there's no geography. So mobility, geography, you know, uh, circular food economy, where is it grown, where is it processed, where is it sold, that kind of thing. So if you have a chance, and I don't know whether, yeah, that did show up there, you know, snap that, you can get the uh, URL. This is the, uh, proposal from the city of Montreal and the video that went with their proposal. That's an excellent one that talks about, um, I'll get to it here, uh, why you need data to make decisions. You'd be amazed, how, and I worked in government for a long time, so I understand this, how many times decisions are made with a lack of information. Nobody, know, nobody really knows, but sort of everybody, oh, we're sort of feeling this or we think that, because they don't have the data. I mean, that's, that's the simple, that's the simple, uh, Simple issue. So they, uh, and there's many reasons why they don't have the data. Number one, it may not exist. Number two is they can't access it. Number three, they can access it, but they can't use it. They can't read it in their system, so it's not interoperable. And uh, another reason is they might not just be ready for the kind of analysis they want that they want to do. So I would highly recommend having a look at that uh, that uh, video because it, it is an excellent video. Now this, if, you're, uh, if you've ever been, if you've ever gone to a presentation, uh, how, to make a pre how to do a presentation, what they say is don't put too much stuff on the slide. So what do I do? I put a ton of stuff on the slide. And why do they do that? This, if you're running, say, a city, there is a ton of stuff going on. I mean, the only reason I put tornadoes on is because you're in Ottawa. But uh, you can see some of the others, construction, energy, police, crime, uh, Factories, forests, I mean, everything. I mean, there's a lot going on. And how do you try and holistically look at all of this stuff that's going on and, and try and make some sense of it? So what we try and do, rather than like just picking one, like let's pick, uh, I don't know, lightning strikes or thunderstorms, like what the impact of that if something happens. Um, rather than doing the individual precision farming or precision uh, uh, public works, that kind of stuff, instead of looking at each individual one, you try and compartmentalize them. So this is how we've compartmentalized, we compartmentalize SDIs. Um, one is mapping and visualization, monitoring. So you're just watching what's going on. Field mobility, so you're sending, you have people out in the field. Uh, data management, 
uh, an analytics or analysis, uh, sharing and collaboration, so we get the data around, decision support, citizen engagement, and design and planning. So I'll give a couple of examples of some of these. So mapping and visualization, um, I don't know how well you can see it, but uh, the one on the left in the middle, that's the underground infrastructure. So there's two examples there. One is the upper one is sort of virtual reality where everything is virtual. Where the second one is you, have, you actually see the street or whatever, but if you're looking at your phone or whatever, you can see the infrastructure underneath the street in, in uh, let's say the piper in that, in that example. So those are, there's a lot of those that are actually going on. And, and actually one of the, uh, about a year ago, we, uh, um, we noticed a huge spike in the use of Canadian data uh, just in late summer. And so what the heck's going on here? Somebody did some analysis. Any, anybody think of anything that, any rage that happened about the end of last summer? Not, uh, yeah, last, uh, sorry, not last summer, the summer before. Pokemon Go, <laughs> can you imagine? They were hitting the servers and all of a sudden they, so that's, that's your augmented reality and how it can impact things. Um, how many would have thought that taxation was a, a, a GIS application? Yeah, there's a few here, yeah. If you're, if you're assessing properties, there's a lot of things, especially in Vancouver and other, this is actually um, Maricopa County in the States um, where uh, based on the elevation and the view and how much sun you get, your, your assessment will be different. And I see I'm running out of time, so I'll run through these a little more quickly. Uh, data management, we have uh, the community map of Canada, which you can see on the left there. And we're getting data in from hundreds of different uh, cities and provinces, whatever, they're open data, feed it in automatically and, and update the map. So somewhere we have to keep track of it. So that's that, uh, that one there, uh, networks, of course, drone imagery. This example here is where uh, just a drone image of, a, ma of a, a house. But the interesting one for you folks is the one in the upper uh, left corner. That is a cell phone coverage map. And I'll tell you right now, that's not for Canada because they don't have it, they won't allow it. The companies won't allow it. Um, and we actually went to the CRTC to talk to them, but next, gener next generation 911, when they found the business they were in, they said, can you produce that map for Canada? They said, wow. Okay, so I see I'm getting the hook here, so I'll try and, uh, field mobility, you can go out in the field and collect all kinds of data, uh, monitoring, um, so CCDs, uh, uh, your, your video, uh, C C um, so CCTVs, you know, view shed, monitoring, uh, even Edmonton here as a, uh, a pothole dashboard <laughs> for, they have so many potholes, they have to provide that to the city and, or to the folks. Analytics, uh, a lot of examples here of uh, different examples of in, in, um, in analytics uh, for planning, um, visualization of new structures, um, predictive maintenance, risk planning, that's a, a huge area. Uh, decision support, so this is the one I was talking about earlier where you try and make your decision based on real data. Uh, and we are working very closely with New Brunswick on their um, uh, New Brunswick NG911 system. But the other interesting thing is that what's called a common operating picture. In fact, if you remember the, um, the riots in, Victoria, in Vancouver, uh, one of the issues, because there's, it was, there's such a big impact, is because the various uh, services couldn't talk to each other. There was no commu proper communications. They commu created a new organization to do that. Uh, but now they're all, everybody, and a lot of the, these public safety places are all going to this common operating platform where everybody sees the same thing. So the police and the fire and the ambulance and everybody that's responding sees the same, uh, sees the same picture. And we're down to a minute here, so I'll go through... Uh, Hydro coverage map, uh, hydro outage maps, very popular. Uh, and I do want to give kudos to the, with the open data one there. That's the city of Brampton. If you want to see sort of the poster child for this kind of thing, check out that site, the city of Brampton. They provide all their open data, all their open maps, all their open apps are all on the same site, very easy to find. Um, sharing and collaboration, uh, a lot of people are putting out their, uh, their open data. The feds are doing a pretty good job uh, providing that uh, that kind of data, and the, the interesting thing is you don't always have to ha have to um, 
be providing the data to the, to the public, you can do it, have it in just in groups or just various select people. You don't have to share it with everybody. So in summary, um, it's an integrating technology. Uh, we've you know, looked at some of the uh, applications to system of record insight and engagement, um, the use for sharing and exchange and development of gauging uh, engagement. Um, we talked about the nine different patterns of use and uh, quickly go through. So just as a takeaway, um, so geospatial data can be leveraged. Uh, an SDI is a way of shuffling this around and it can make government uh, businesses and citizen uh, decisions that can uh, assist with that. And I believe that's it. But I have a question. Does anybody know what the red lines are on there? Somebody must know. We're some of the experts here. That's the National Road Network of Canada displayed on a map. You can see it's pretty heavy down in southern Ontario and out west, but up north, pretty sparse. Anyway, that's my presentation. Thank you.